Um, Mr. Rosen, we've been giving a bit of thought to your uh, response. So far as the respondent's notice is concerned, I think we both do have concerns about it. Um, if the uh, submissions that Mr. Howard has made on his appeal don't persuade us, you don't need it. If, however, he did persuade us that, that the having heard what some of you want to say in response, that the judge did get the sentence wrong, it seems to us that it would be very difficult for us to take into account the matters in the respondent's notice, because many of them, I think, are disputed. They raise a large number of factual contentions. And I think, speaking for myself, we would, in those circumstances, be much more likely to remit the matter for resentencing below, where all the points that either side wish to make, including those in your respondent's notice, could then be deployed. Now, I think, uh, if my Lord agrees, we, we don't really wish to hear from you on the, on the respondent's notice points. I think what we would like to hear from you in particular is the response to the points that have been argued this morning by Mr. Howard. And concentrating perhaps not so much on the history, but on the judge's, what the judge says in his sentencing remarks, particularly at paragraphs 31 and following dealing with what can broadly be called culpability, and paragraph 36, where he deals with harm. Uh, that seems to us to be the essence of the matters which we will need to resolve in order to preserve this appeal. I don't know if my Lord wants to add anything. No. So um, can you proceed on, on that basis? Yes, my lord. I'll just say one thing about the, just the respondent's notice. Yes. The um, Miss Stepanova isn't in a position to suggest any of the facts in the respondent's notice are disputed. All of those matters were contained in affidavit affidavits before Mr. Justice Richard Smith at the contempt hearing, and my learned friend did not challenge Mr. Uh, Joe Hall, my instructing solicitor, whose affidavits there were on any of those facts I mean, and matters. My Lord's point is that it would take us an enormous amount of time to go into the factual matters, even, even on that basis. Yes, my Lord. And you don't need to go any further um, than your own skeleton argument. For example, um, paragraph 66, um, where you say, subparagraph 3, S made a dishonest attempt to settle the county court proceedings with a view to concealing the value of the company and the extent of a misappropriation of the said company's assets from the diversion of his business. Where's the finding made anywhere that that was a dishonest attempt to settle the county court proceedings? The, the, my, my Lord, it's not the fact that there was a finding to that effect. Well, in which case, um, you, you would be asking this court to make a finding of fact. Based on unchallenged evidence, my Lord. But you would be asking this court to, to try and make a finding, a series of findings of the fact. Now, I don't, that, that particular one, um, I think, is disputed. Now, you may say that um, Ms. Stepanova didn't give evidence on the point, but it's still a disputed finding of fact. Yes, but on that point, I, I think uh, if, well, I, know, I think it was ground three, possibly two of the appeal, um, one of them was the judge took that into account in his sentencing, that he took into account, and I think that's now been abandoned because it's clear that, he, as your lordship's indicated, there was no finding yeah. either way. But that's uh, a different point. I mean, no, I understood, my lord. I, I, that was my way of challenging. But yes. Yes, yes. all of these, all of these arguments, attempt to blackmail, dishonest, lied, lied, poisoned the judge's mind, sending a, a letter making serious allegations of impropriety, etc. You know, you, you, it's just unreal to expect this court sitting here this afternoon 
to go through the evidence and make those findings, um, serious findings that you invite against Ms. Stefanova without having heard the totality of the evidence, without having read the totality of the evidence in the sort of detail that would be required. It's just unreal. Uh, un understood, my Lord. I I'm more than happy to focus on, um, in terms of the fresh evidence point, which I think destroys any suggestion that Ms. Stefanova was contrite, not to focus on the respondent's notice, that the existence of a bank account, which in her affidavit, this is the fresh evidence point. Um, uh, that's different. The, yes. the, the point my Lord put to you and you were pushing back on yes. was the respondent's notice point. And I've just been reading down your summary of the respondent's notice in your skeleton yes, and pointing Lord. out to you that I just don't see how we can conceivably do it. I understand, my Lord. I, and I, and I, again, both your Lordship and Lord Justice Nugis, um, um point on that accepted. I just wanted to correct the point that the matters were disputed in the sense of there was unchallenged affidavit evidence for those points. So there wasn't that it was disputed. At the, the time place to raise any dispute was the contempt hearing. But I, but I will not um, proceed on the basis of the respondent's notice, my Lord. Um, the starting point for us is the fresh evidence application, uh, because this is obviously an incredibly important point, which goes to a number of parts of the judge's reasoning process in terms of uh, culpability, contrition, and, and so on. Um, one of the points your Lordships have seen is that we had the freezing injunctions granted in December, um, both by Mr Justice Zaccaroli and Mr Justice Mead. They were then continued by uh, Dame uh, Sarah Worthington, uh, King's Counsel, um, it, on the 7th of February. Um, Ms Stefanova was required, for the purposes of policing the freezing injunctions, to provide weekly bank statements, in addition to providing, as at the date of the orders, bank copies of all bank statements to which she was a signatory. Rather than comply with that order, at the same time as not providing any bank statements, she was secretly opening bank accounts up. Now, um, that, is, that does feature in the two bank accounts we were aware of, I think three, does in fact feature in the judge's judgment, the Santander account, the Metrobank account, and uh, the Bank of Scotland account. Those aren't appealed. So speaking for myself, I have not sought to get my head around all the various accounts, when they were opened, when they were closed, how much money they had in them, what money went into them, what money went out of them, and so on. Um, if it's necessary to do so, you'll have to fill us in on the details. I am grateful, my lord. Um, I, I will come to the Santander accounts, I will in terms of the bank statements, just a single page. My point is that a lot has been relied upon on Miss Stefanova coming clean in her affidavit, purging her contempt at the 11th hour of the evening before the contempt hearing. Here's my affidavit, I'm very sorry, I've complied. That, and the point I'm making is, when the judge, um, having heard the two, two, we were in court for two days, having made the sentencing um, judgment, the judge was operating on the basis that Ms. Stefanova had come clean, there were no other bank accounts, she had, although she still hadn't complied with the order, with the orders providing the outstanding bank statements, because what Ms. Stefanova had done is only provide the bank statements which are the subject matter of the four corners of the contempt application. She still hadn't provided any bank statements on the 28th of January. So what the judge said was, well look, if you provide those, then I will suspend the sentence. What, what I, so so with respect to those accounts, I, I don't, obviously the judge's decision is, is correct. We then discover that five days before Ms. Stefanova's affidavit, she has closed another bank account with Revolut, which he'd opened up on the 2nd of March, which tens of thousands of pounds have gone through. So if the judge had been aware in the course of sentencing that Miss Stepanova actually made a, a barefaced lie in her affidavit, where she says, paragraph 24, for the sake of completeness, here are the missing bank uh, statements, here's the Santander accounts, here is the Metrobank, here, here's my explanation. She's giving the impression to the court that's it. There's nothing else to proceed. Okay, but can, can you not... Um, my Lord has already said to you, we'd quite like you to address your remarks um, in a structured way, in, in the, the structure that the Lord put to you, which don't engage, don't depend at the moment on the fresh evidence. In other words, if are, are you suggesting that this appeal, were it not for the fresh evidence, would have some legs? No, not my Lord, I'm right. not suggesting so, that. So why don't you meet the appeal on the basis on which it is put, Understood without that. reference to the fresh evidence, and then it, then we can get to the fresh evidence at the end of it. But 
to start with uh, parading the fresh evidence or trailing it before us when we've indicated that it's not been the focus of the appeal seems to be starting in the wrong place. I, look, my lords, I, I, I said what I said about the fresh evidence. I will engage with the four corners of the grounds of appeal, which is what the reason we are here and, and take it as, as I, in terms of my submissions and deal with the appeal which is before the court. So, to my lord, so dealing with the first, well, the, the starting point is um, when one looks at Mr. Joshua Richard Smith's judgment, there are no challenges to the findings the judge made, as I understand it. So, paragraphs 31 to 36, in fact, all paragraphs, there's no suggestion in the grounds of appeal that any of the findings are wrong. That's well, you say that. The impression I had was that Mr. Howard was seeking to persuade us that although, of course, he accepted, as had been accepted in her affidavit, that there had been breaches of the orders, and he accepted, as he has to, that of the seven issues that were still in contention, she lost on six of them, and he doesn't seek to challenge those. Nevertheless, in the grand scheme of things, these were not very serious contempt. They were um, minor things that, that had little impact on you or your ability to conduct your proceedings, and that really he was saying she did her best when she was acting in person. She didn't get it quite right. Once she got legal aid, we came on board, we put a lot of work in, and we did pretty well get it right apart from the ones that, that we argued about. And she should have been sentenced on that basis that there wasn't really that level of seriousness which merited the sentence that was passed. So I don't think it's quite right to say that, that he accepts all the findings of fact. Because one of the findings of fact is that these are deliberate flouting of orders and so on and so forth. And that doesn't sit entirely comfortably with the way in which he addressed us this morning. So I think I think we do need to be shown why you say the judge was justified in concluding these were deliberate, contumelious, serious flouting orders which caused harm or risk of harm that was real and serious rather than trivial or, or theoretical or, as he said, merely caused a bit of delay. I that, I think, it is where understood. we would be most assisted in having your submissions. I'm grateful, my lord. Um, the, as regards to whether or not um, the breaches were intentional, well, my first argument is to separate, obviously, the contempt of the county court yes. order with the high court. So focusing on the county court order, as my learned friend said at the beginning of his submissions, we succeeded at trial on the 6th of October 2021. Yes. Um, and the court made a declaration that we were in effect in equity, we had a specifically enforceable right to 50% of an ownership of the company. Can we see that? Yes. I, I, I thought as a judge, Gerald was quite careful at trial to say, well, it depends what the company's been used for. No, my, my lord, he found as a matter of um, principle, um, which I'll just find the, I just find the reference to. Uh, he found as a matter of principle that it, it was an agreement which was capable of specific performance, but he declined in his discretion to award it to, to, to award specific performance because he didn't feel as if he actually had the full grasp of the circumstances. Indeed, my lord. Right. But the point is, when the court says, as a matter of principle, you have a, a specifically enforceable contract, then it's a specifically well, it, the it's an obligation it. which is in concept specifically enforceable. The question is whether, in his as a matter of discretion, it should be. Yes, my lord. So, right. absolutely. Um, the order, to correct my own friend, it wasn't a consent order which was made on the, the 6th of October order, which is at page uh, supplemental bundle, page 41. Um, now, at, at that stage, um, declared that orally contracted 50% be issued to and registered, which contract is specifically enforceable, being part of a contract to invest in a new business supplying Luminera. My understanding from what Mr. Howard showed us of his Honour Judge Gerald's judgment at 34 and following is that he
He did not decide whether the contract was simply in relation to Unimera or whether it extended to whatever other business the company did. And, and that may be, that's why he declined to order certificates of performance, because he said if the company had done something entirely different, it wasn't necessarily appropriate to grant certificates. Yes, my lord, he used the analogy. He said if she started selling Teslas, as in the, the motor yes. vehicles, then. You um, didn't have a claim to 50% of the Tesla business. That, that, that's, yes. yes. And, he's, and that's why the wording in the order is a paragraph uh, 2B, um, substantially similar. Now, I see. Um, and that's when we realised that everything Ms. Stefanova did was substantially similar. But in terms of the doctor, so Ms. Stefan, the idea was Ms. Stefanova was given, this is in effect a second chance for Ms. Stefanova to provide information. The court had made an earlier order, my lords, on the 29th of March 2021, which is at page 28 of the supplemental bundle. Yeah. So just to get the chronology right, I think, because it does go to whether or not Ms. Stefanova's, uh, in, my submissions, con in my submission, her conduct was um, intentional. Um, Yes, yeah, so uh, page 28, the order is page 30, dated 29th of March. This is at the case management conference. Paragraphs 5 and 6 on page 29, my lords, sets out disclosure, paragraph 6, witness statements, and the paragraph 10 is a list of preliminary issues to be determined. Yes. So um, we, we, we have the trial. Um, Ms. Stefanova is found um, to have uh, not to be a credible witness. To an effectively dishonestly trick Mr. Kowadra into believing, into seeking to make him believe the company was failing while simultaneously negotiating exclusive distribution rights with Luminera and of um, in purely in uh, making a counterclaim of pure invention. But the, what Mr. Stepanova hasn't done, which prevented the judge from determining this issue of relief, is provide any information or witness evidence. So the judge says, okay, well, I need to determine that issue, so I'm going to order her to provide certain information. Um, and the idea, of course, my lords, is to find out what has been going on with the companies, financially. Yes. Um, and the, the order, my lords, goes beyond simply looking at um, companies' bank accounts, because remember, at all material times, my lords, Miss Stefanova is the sole director of this company. It, it also deals with her personal bank accounts. As well, paragraph three on page forty-two. So, my lords, Miss Stefanova, and again, at all material times until shortly before the hearing, as I understand, before Design Judge Parfit in twenty twenty-two September, had counsel and solicitors acting for her. So. She does provide, my lawyer friend, the Lordships to the witness statement of November 2021, providing some information. But it, 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 it raised more questions than it answered. Um, and it was certainly impossible to see what was really going on with the, the company's financial position, what monies were coming in and what monies were going out, particularly the monies, my lords, which were going to Miss Stefanova. So the next stage was. Um, for us, and it was a it was a substantial exercise to go through all the papers, try to work out what Stefanova was saying, try and work out the gaps in what she was saying, to serve on her a Part 18 request on the 4th of April, which is at page 58. Yeah. And at page 72, my lords, is a Part 18 response from Miss Stefanova's Council, obviously on Miss Stefanova's instructions, which is giving the impression that they don't need a paragraph two, that it, there's nothing to there's nothing to be seen here, there's no money in this. It's out of all proportion what you're seeking. And I, I should also say, um, my lords, in February. So a couple of months, about six weeks before this Part 18 response, Miss Stefanova's solicitors on her instructions had said the company had only made a very small profit. And that was referred to in Mr. Joe Hall's affidavit of his unchallenged evidence. 
So Mr. Stefano, the same test list is referred to our small profits, nothing to see here. The part 18 response, it's all, it's out of all proportion. Um, I think they say quantum, sorry. Uh, yes, deficit is out of all proportion. But of course, we don't know if that's correct until we've seen, we, we don't have an idea what the financial position is of the company. And again, pausing there, my lords, by December 2022, what we discover is Ms. Stefanova has had, for her personal benefit, and this isn't in dispute, £452,000 out of the business. So you say, so you discovered that? We discovered that in December 2022, my lord. Was that from her disclosure or was that from the Norwich Pharmacal Order? Um, that was uh, mostly from the Norwich Pharmacal Order, is my understanding. Now, my learned friend refers to the Norwich Pharmacal Order in his application to say, well, that's how we got some of the information. But again, going to whether or not Ms. Stefanova's breaches were um, intentional, she vigorously opposed the making of the, uh, it's actually a non-party, third-party disclosure of the Norwich Pharmacal Order. Um, and suggested that it was a sinister attempt <coughs> by us to gain information. She argued about her human rights. Um, so she was trying to prevent that from happening <coughs> as well. But sticking with the, um, the, the <coughs> chronology, my lord, so we then have um, our application, because we didn't get, that's the response we got to the Part 18 request. We then have the hearing on the 13th of May of our application for further information. Um, and your lordship was your lordship's taken to the order earlier on at page 88 of the supplemental bundle. Um, now, I, unlike my, my, my learned friend, I was counsel, as your lordship will see from the recital, um, at that hearing. And Sam, 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 um, Samuel Lawton um, was also present for Miss Stefanova. Now, uh, my lords, this goes to the disingenuous point on the skirt and argument, which is not a suggestion of my learned friend's being disingenuous. Any suggestion of this being disingenuous or dishonest is aimed at the only person in the room has been found to be disin in effect been found to be dishonest, intentionally breached court orders, which is Miss Stefanova. Well, the, the wording of your skeleton is singularly unfortunate. Then I refer to S. S is skeleton argument. It's Miss Stefanova. That's her skeleton argument, my lord. Yes, prepared by it's a skeleton argument prepared by counsel. Well, I again, my learned friend is operating on instructions, Miss Stefanova. If she's going to approve everything, I'm not suggesting my learned friend has intentionally or otherwise said anything misleading to this court. Any allegation, I'm absolutely clear about this now, and I apologise if there was any uh, miscommunication or misunderstanding. It's Miss Stefanova I'm talking about. My learned friend has had the unfortunate, is unfortunately being dip, dip, dipped in and out of these proceedings at various times. Miss Stefanova is fully aware, having acted in person, of what's going on. So I, if, if there's any miscommunication... I, I think one does need to be very careful, Mr. Yes, Rosemary or using words like dishonest and disingenuous, particularly when applied to a skeleton argument, which, as you know, is the product of counsel and is not always seen, let alone approved, by the litigant. I, for my part, am not at all surprised that Mr. Howard took exception to the statement that his skeleton, which he set up, disingenuous and read it as a criticism of him personally. I think one needs to be very careful before using words like that and to be very clear about who it is that one needs to trust. Understood. Whose integrity is being impugned. Understood. And, and it's not something um, that should be banded about lightly. Um, and even with litigants, as you know, Council should not make allegations of deliberate impropriety without having a sufficient factual basis. Now, I don't, myself, particularly want to get into whether or not Ms. Stefanova, had she said it herself, would have been disingenuous. I think I've said enough to make it clear that I think it was a very unfortunate turn of phrase in your skeleton argument, which I am not at all surprised. Understood, my lord. Um, as regards to well, move on, um, so I'm going to return to the order at, at page 88, the supplemental bundle. Um, now, this is the order where Miss Stefanova, pursuant to part 18 and 31.14, 
of the CPR with respect to the order to provide further information as per, um, I should say it's in identical terms to the Part 18 request for the month before, sorry, in April, 4th of April, and the list of documents. Now, um, one of the points raised against, in, in, unfortunately, the, the, the uh, paragraph which uh, my Lords we were just considering, um, about us not setting our case out, and, 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 uh, and that I've taken exception to, in my skeleton argument, is that for obvious reasons, at a contested hearing, which it was a contested hearing, Mr. His Honour Judge Gerald would not have been able to make an order under CPR Part 18 or 31.14 unless the judge was plainly satisfied that the categories of information and documentation we were seeking were relevant to triable issues, issues for determination at trial, because it's trite law that the court can't make under Part 18 or Part 31 for specific inspection, unless the court is satisfied, they're relevant to the issues to be resolved. Um, during the course of that hearing, and this is referred to in the transcript, um, uh, in, when we had the proceedings upon his own, uh, sorry, Mr. Justice Richard Smith, the contempt hearing, when my learned friends raised the argument they didn't know what our claim was, I took, I, I explained to the judge, going back to this hearing, um, that we had in fact taken the His Honour Judge Gerald to um, a recent House of Law, sorry, so a recent High Court decision in the case of Rahman and Rahman, not dissimilar facts, where there were, in that case, three equal shareholders, um, and one of the shareholders had been excluded, and what he sought was specific performance of an oral agreement concerning shares, and the damages that were part and parcel of um, the relief of specific performance and or in addition to specific performance. Was a payment of fifty, a payment of equating to fifty percent of the distributions, the monies that the other two shareholders had taken in his absence. And so the judge, hearing those submissions, was satisfied that the information we were seeking in the Part 18 request and the specific list of specific categories of documents were all relevant to enable the court to work out how much money Miss Stefanova may have to pay us. In damages. That's why the order was made. Um, we then have um, Miss Stefanova's attempts to wriggle out of having to comply with the order, my lords. We've got a letter um, on so it's supplemented on page 354. There's two letters from her solicitors. 154. Sorry, no, sorry, my lord. Uh, 354 is the first one. 354. 354, my lord, yes. So that here the parties are sort of considering terms of an offer made by Miss Stefanova to settle um, the proceedings. And we are pushing back saying, well, no, you were in effect found you know, to have been untruthful in your evidence, so we should be getting indemnity costs. And then after that... Uh, Sorry, three, 354 is a letter from... From Miss Stefanova's solicitors, then solicitors, to, to my instructing solicitors, my lord. So you'll see from the third paragraph, Miss Stefanova is using her open offer to give us the shares as a way around having to provide the information that, that his Judge Gerald on the 13th of May has ordered her to provide. Okay, w w this is a response to which, where's the letter is this responding to? I don't think it's in um, the bundle, my lord, but it's... It is, it's plain from this, um, and I don't think it's in dispute, that Miss Stefanova made an offer, and that offer was referred to... So, as so just to be clear, yes. this is the offer that your respondents notice would have asked us to find Miss Stefanova made dishonestly, and the, the, the letter making the offer is not even in the bundle? No, well, the, the first letter is to which I report, it's page 89 of the bundle, I do apologise. Um, remember, my Lord... Right. A second ago, I referred your lordship to the fact that in um, prior to this letter of 18, page 80, 89, is 
dated the 20th of June 2022. February 2022, Ms. Stefanova is telling us the company made a very small profit. In, uh, sub in response to the Part 18 request, where she says it'd be out of all proportion, it's on the basis that there's very small amounts of money, nominal claim for damages, nothing to see here. She then makes an open offer close to the deadline for compliance, which I think was the 24th of um, yeah. June, yeah. four days before. Right. Okay. We have this offer, my lord, coming in. Um, and the offer is she makes us a shareholder and director of the company. With retrospective effect on the, regarding the shareholding the 30th of April 2018. I've taken your lordships to the subsequent letter she sent on the 30th of June, where they then say, well, we've made an offer now. It'd be disproportionate and unreasonable for our client to provide the information. Your client made a counteroffer, it seems. Yes, my client did. And that, I think, was for indemnity costs. Is that the counteroffer in the bundle? No, my lord, it is not in the bundle. Right. Um, but the, the, the point for take, taken from this is, we, I've done our best to try to understand what the financial position was. We have no, at this stage, we have no idea that Miss Stefanova has had out of the company half a million, nearly half a million pounds. We don't, we, we simply don't know that. Also, the lordships will notice this isn't a full and final settlement. If we're made a shareholder, it, it opens the door for us to continue to find out what happened to the monies in an unfair prejudice petition. So the real argument from our perspective at that stage, not knowing what we subsequently realised in December when we went to the banks directly, is that Miss Stefanova had tremendous amounts of money out, or substantial amounts of monies out previously. I've not um, quite understood. I mean, I understand why you say, on the basis of the third paragraph of the letter at page 354, that, that the other side was hoping that if you accepted the offer, they wouldn't need to provide the information. I've not quite understood why why you characterise that as wriggling out of, of things, because, as you just said, if you have retrospectively made a shareholder from 2018, you're entitled to information as to what's happened in the company. So sooner or later, um, you will be able to pursue all those. those I, I have no knowledge as to whether or not that was, mis that, 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 that was something Miss Stefanova was advised about. But you all we can see... She had solicitors and quite possibly counsel at the time. The solicitors have put forward an offer which gives you your 50% shareholding in the company. I think I'd be very reluctant to reach a conclusion that that was being done with some nefarious intent. It looks to me like an offer to, in an attempt to settle the proceedings. Well, my lord, the timing of the offer four days before the deadline when Miss Stefanova plainly hadn't made any attempt whatsoever to comply with the order. Um, and again, at the hearing we had on the um, 8th of July, the same argument was made again by Miss Stefanova's counsel. It was a telephone hearing in front of his own Judge Gerald, um, where she again said that she didn't need to comply. And the judge's response was, well, how do I know you haven't asset stripped the company? Um, which is prophetic, obviously, because that's precisely what Miss Stefanova had done. I mean, that is indisputable. It's, it's plain. And it come, I'll come to the, the points in, in terms of harm in a moment. But what we have is, and my lord, I, I'm not asking your lordship. I'm not. I'm resting the argument I'm making simply on this, on these letters. One has to look at all the conduct which followed later, and as the judge rightly found, which isn't under appeal, the information Miss Stefanova was providing was misleading, as in she was saying things which were demonstrably untrue yes. as to what money she okay, had. Okay. Well, let's 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 proceed with the chronology. At the moment, what I've noted is that. Her solicitors made an offer to settle the proceedings and said, if you accept it, then we won't need to provide the information, and you didn't accept it. We didn't, my lord. And then we have um, page 121, which is under Judge Gerald's order at the, um, the telephone. Well, you told period. us that was 8th of July. But the telephone uh, it is the 8th of July. The order was sealed a few days later. Yeah. Um, now, looking at this order, my friend made a point earlier that, um, that we were ordered to... Um, paragraph 2, 
filed and served written submissions to confirm our position, whether or not the first defendant had complied with paragraph one of the order, which is the further information and specific inspection, and in respect of relief we were seeking. Now, um, we had understood that to me, given the nature of the part 18 requests and the basis on which the order was made on the 13th of May, that obviously we need to get the information first for us to be able to say more than what we currently pleaded, um, which, which is fair enough. Uh, I think, I, don't, I mean, it's, I, it's, a reasonable, it's, a, it's, it's a reasonable construction of the order, which is supported, my lords, by the order over the following page. So um, we did file, pursuant to that order, a, let, a letter from my solicitor saying, our position is, Miss Stefanova hasn't complied with the order. Now again, she had solicitors and, and counsel acting for her throughout this period of time. Um, so, have, notwithstanding Miss Stefanova is aware of our position, she hasn't provided the information, so it, it, what, st what choice do we have, given that we succeeded in trial on the 6th of October 2021, it's nearly a year later, Miss Stefanova isn't providing the information, we're getting these various ineffective CMCs, case management conferences or milestone hearings, as Andrew Darrell refers to them, we're not getting any further. So the decision's made to make an application for, uh, to strike out the uh, Miss Stefanova and to debar her from participation in the proceedings to find that... Uh, had she provided... Of a, of a date of April July, she hadn't provided anything? She had... What we had is the witness statement from November 2021, which my learned friend took the court to earlier, which, as I said earlier, raised more questions than it answered. Yes. Which is why we said the Part 18 request. That's the one which she says cost her £25,000 and was settled yes. by solicitors with the assistance of yes. that. My learned friend submitted that she paid that money. Um, of course, she didn't. She subsequently admitted she helped herself and the company to pay the money. Miss Stefanova spent over £116,000 of the company's monies, which we didn't discover and she wasn't prepared to um, confirm until after the committal application. But... Uh, so, my, my lord, that, that's that point. But in terms of evidence she provided, as I understand it, there's a letter um, which is at page 356 of the supplemental bundle. Um, this is what Miss Stefanova handed to uh, my solicitors outside immediately before the hearing in front of his honour judge Parfix, at page 356. So, if I go back to my question, Sorry. As, as at the 8th of July 2022, when the order page 121 is made, there'd be no further attempt to comply with the 13th of May order, which is why it extends the time to 5th of August. Yes, ma'am. And as at 5th of August, there was still no further... She'd entirely failed to comply with that, with the Part 18 request, my lord, yes. So I do apologise for misunderstanding your lordship's question. Yes. That, that is the position. So all you've got is the witness statement from November 2021. Correct, my lord, yes, and then you issue an application for what, an unless order? Um, it was, no, my lord, I think, well, I think maybe in the alternative we've sought an unless order, but the primary position was to, was to strike, strike her out and debar, debar her. So you apply to debar her, and that is the one which comes before his honour judge Parfit in September, and you say you were handed this letter, which is dated the day before the hearing, at 356, is that right? That is correct, my lord, yes. Right, I don't think we've read this letter. Would you like to tell me what you get from it? Um, various allegations made against uh, myself, my instructing solicitor, Mr. Kawaja. Um, page 357 at the top, my lord, you'll see Miss Stefanova's um, position regarding the Norwich Pharmacal application, which is about six lines down. Um, Sorry, five lines down. They've now made an application that Barclays Bank hand over all of my bank statements. I submit it's absolutely ridiculous, unnecessary, and sinister on the part of the claimant. It's a breach of my human rights. Yeah. Um, then goes on to say, because my instructing solicitor, indeed myself, previously acted in proceedings against Mr. Kawaja, that, that we have somehow acting in a conflict of interest, which is referred to paragraph 358. Um, 
Page 359, um, she says, I do not want to work with the claimant as he's abused me in the past, treated me unfairly, made sexual comments which made me feel uncomfortable. She then, um, unfortunately, uh, yes, the, the, the point my friend said that the, there was, she, he referred to it actually in her witness statement in 2021, I think it's kind of re repeated here, is the idea that Mr. Kawaja failed to comply with his terms of the agreement, which of course Ms. Stefanova can't say because that was an express finding against her. The judge didn't believe anything Ms. Stefanova said in that respect and expressly found that Mr. Kawaja had, done, had fully complied with his terms of the agreement. Um, suggesting that she spent money, her own money, on this. And then um, there's a summary. Yes, page 361, my lord, just to go for each of these points. The first point was, as I just said, Miss Stefanova, and I think I will say it is dishonest at this stage because she's argued this, she's been found to have lied about it by his Honour Judge Gerald, and she's repeating the same point that we breached our terms of the agreement. Um, there's allegations about uh, my, my client, um, something to do with tax. She's fraud. acting in person at this stage. She, she is acting in person with the assistance it of the county friend. It's not unknown for litigants in person to have difficulty accepting findings of judges and to repeat points for them which they have already lost without necessarily being um, honest. But I, I have your submission that these points were not open to her because they've been decided against her. But I should say, my lord, the, the, the point about the breach of contract, she instructed her solicitors, Blake Turner, to make exactly the same allegation after the trial. Yes. Okay. Um, then we have um, the... Uh, I would say, uh, this is dishonest, paragraph six, but I, again, she makes the assertion that she paid £114,000 towards legal fees. Um, but of course, we eventually discover that the true position is she's just been freely helping herself to the company's money to do that. But either way, my lords, the lordships can read through this. It has a statement of truth at the end, I should say, as well, page 367. None of this is dealing with the information she should be providing in accordance with his well, judgment. Paragraph 8 says, I've already, I've already done it. Yes. Yeah. And that's a reference to the November 21 witness statement. Yes. Which is, of course, not true. Yeah. She hasn't done it. So, um, he's done it. Judge Path, it makes the order back at page 122. Now, the yes, Miss Stefanova was acting in person, but Miss Honourable Judge Path, it was very careful, and, and um, this did this is referred to as Miss Justice Richard Smith's judgment to explain to Miss Stefanova the serious nature of the penal notice, and it wasn't uh, my my, my uh, client, Mr. Kawaja, who requested the penal notice. It was. It was the judge's own suggestion. It, it was. And, and the reason for that was the judge wasn't prepared to accede to our application that Miss Stefanova should be struck out or debarred. His way of, his way of dealing with it is to say, I, I appreciate we've got to where we've got to. However, I'm in effect going to give her another last chance, this is last chance saloon time, for her to now comply with the court's orders. And I'm, but I'm going to put a penal notice on the order. And he said to her, you're going to go to prison if you don't comply with it. Now, um, Again, this order is in, save for the penal notice and the unless provision, is, as my learned friend confirmed earlier, has the identical schedules to that yep. annexed to it in our judge's order. What this order doesn't have is any, is any direction that my client has to serve a statement of case. So my point is, where Ms. Stefanova in submission today is, and again in the scope of an argument, is saying, well, we had no idea what their case was, and it all goes to this, you know, we're, we're being oppressive, it's all unfair, which is essentially the argument being raised. They haven't even pleaded their case, as Honor Judge Gerald you know, has raised issues in 2023. Um, my point is that is, it's not correct, I'll put it that way, to make any of those submissions, because the party and well, the I court, think you're, with respect, rolling a whole load of stuff up in um, one point that Mr. Howard made was that the um, Part 18 request and the extent of the Part 18 request um, was excessive. It was um, over elaborate or um, oppressive. That, that's one point he made, which is entirely 
separate from this question about whether you served your statement of the case, as I understood his submissions. His submissions were, look at, if you're looking at the type of breach of the order, look, for example, he took us to the um, one about the um, training agency. Yes. Uh, and if you, you can trace it through, um, you can trace through the uh, paragraphs you know, that in relation, in paragraph 29 of the witness statement, the word, so you can go back to... 2021 witness statement, my lord. Uh, the 20, I think, it, well, yes, it's the 2021 witness statement. Yes, my lord. So you go back to the 2021 witness statement, which is... I uh, myself, my lord. Uh, again, it's at uh, supplementary, supplementary at paragraph, supplementary 54, isn't it? There we go, in the middle of paragraph 29. This, Mr. Howard took us to the sentence in the middle of it. Yes. I work night and day, including weekends, to make relationships with suppliers and customers and to set up the training academy. You then, at supplementary bundle 124, say in the middle of the words set up the training academy, paragraph 7, the first defendant is requested to clarify and provide full particulars as to the training academy. You, you then get an answer at 288. Um, which is provided... Uh, paragraph 7 to 8, 8, my lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just looking at the date of this document. Sorry, give me a second. November. 4th of November. It's, it's uh, 4th of November. Um, the defendants do not provide training academy. What the claim is referring to is an advanced aesthetic training session where doctors and nurses are trained on how to use the product. So that's the answer that's given. And then there's a sort of this question is vague, and the defendants provide the claim to provide further information on what they're requesting in this question. So, but you know, there is an answer given. Howard says, well, the judge found that that answer um, wasn't a full answer to the request, and therefore breach of the order, therefore contempt. And he says, look, you know, that's modest at best. Absolutely. If, breach. if that was the only contempt found against Mr. Stefanova in respect of, of, of um, his notice part of its order, right. then we'd be acting disproportionately. And that's, yeah. you see, that, so that's the time, that's the submission making in relation to uh, the oppressive nature of the request. He was making it in the context of saying, look at the breach. Um, you've tried to wrap it all in as if he was also complaining about your failure to comply with um, provision of information about the relief that you were seeking. Uh, you you wrap it all in together and it's it's not really the same. Uh, you know, we need to stick to the points to the made. I, I'm going, I think that the point is um, that the argument made against me, which was made earlier, was this is all just us being oppressive, asking for more and more and more. To, to quote my own friend Scared and argue, you were setting Mr. Stefan over up to fail. There was some sort of agenda, a tactic. Whereas our position is, she's in sole control of the business. We have no idea what's going on. We need to know what's going on. The court needs to know what go what's going on. What the different revenue streams are coming to business, what the expenses are, to enable us to actually get relief for a trial we won in October. And so what I'm, what I'm saying here is that um, the court, notwithstanding, so that this goes to the, the point about we haven't pleaded our case properly as well. Ms. Stefanova, knows, Ms. Stefanova knows why we need this information. The court's been satisfied repeatedly that we need this information for the purposes of the issues and the proceedings. Um, she's had ample opportunity to comply with these orders. So I don't quite understand my learned friend's suggestion that we're being... You know, we've just everything's oppressive, and we're just we're going OTT with all of this. Essentially, what he seems to be saying, when Miss Stefanova, by the time of the contempt hearing, has about a, has had about a year of notice of the information we've been seeking, but still has repeatedly failed to provide it. You know, the, we ask her voluntarily, please provide it. She doesn't. The court orders her to provide it. She doesn't. The court only orders that on the basis that it knows what our case is. Otherwise, it couldn't have ordered it. And that and that position goes all the way through. Um, to, to hear, and, and I'm seeing, I appreciate I'm doing two things at once in terms of this order, because I wanted to make the point that Miss Stefanova is under no illusion as to why we need this information. The court is satisfied 
itself as to why we need this information. And Mr. And Mr. Stepanovich simply isn't providing it, regardless. No, and speaking for myself, I mean, I would be more, well, I would be assisted by, you know, you doing the inverse to Mr. Howard's exercise using that particular uh, request and contempt finding to, to show us what you say was the most serious either admitted contempt, either admitted breach or failure to provide or, uh, or one that was found. You know, to, to make good, you, know, you, you the judge says these are serious and serious and contumelious flouting of the county court orders. Um, you know, I, I'd quite like, as it were, the, the examples that you would give to, to demonstrate that the judge had was entitled to reach that conclusion. Well, my lord, this go again. What one looks at, I, I would need to go through. There are twenty, I think, as regards to as I just passed its order, twenty-four out of thirty of those contempts relate to Miss Stepanova's failure to provide further information and documentation. Although Miss Stepanova was prepared to admit um, most of them, save seven, the day before, the evening before the hearing, the effect. Given we're talking about a great deal of further information, all going to understanding the financial position of the company, it, you can't isolate the six ones that there is, we were content. You know, the, the six ones or two or three my learned friend took the court to. One would have to systematically go through every single each individual ground of contempt in relation to Honour Judge Parfit's order, which went all the way back to the original Part 18 request. But what I can say, um, I, I think striking examples um, to assist your lordship. Would be the fact that well, it's simply Mr. Howard's challenge, if you like, is that the judge um, got wrong the seriousness of the breach. That's his that's his case on appeal, and he says, look at this one, this is nothing, you know. And you in fact could have said on your feet if that was all there was, he'd be, he'd be right. And I'm just saying, okay, so show me yours. Well, you know, what's your? I, I think your phrase, striking examples, is. Picking, picking up what my yeah, yes, I mean, lord I... said, um, your best your best examples of things that she you say she didn't tell you, she knew she was meant to tell you, she deliberately didn't tell you, and the reason she didn't tell you is because she deliberately didn't want you to know. I mean, that's that's your case. Yes. That's what the judge seems to have found. Yes. Uh, what's the what's the most striking example of things which? She um, well, I'll really, go back she, to the part. My lord, sorry. Uh, I do apologise, I wasn't to find. The most striking example, my lord, will be paragraph 8.4 on page 124. And that says, Ms. Stefanova was required to provide an account of all monies that she had received from the second defendant and all related to any of her commercial activities referred to in her witness statement. This is the one going back to 2021, the period of the 20, uh, 1st of April um, 2018 to the date of the request. The request then being dated the 16th of September. Sorry, uh, date 4. 8.6, I do apologise, that's my uh, mis misreading of the Roman numerals, my lord. 8, Sorry. Roman 6. Forced to do the handout. Um, talking, um, talking about the, um, if one is talking about 
things that are sort of potentially oppressive or otherwise. To be asked what was the purpose of the First Amendment purchasing a handbag, which is 84, which you referred to having the bottom in that. Not entirely sure really how much further that takes anybody. You knew that the handbag had been purchased, you knew how much it had been purchased. I mean, I really don't, I have to say, I don't personally understand the purpose. Which, which paragraph is that, my lord? Oh, the 84 you took us to before you got the. Oh, sorry. The numerous yeah, that was the. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's the one with the account, which he has to provide account. I know, but so I mean, we are aware the handbag, we're not talking about, uh, I think it was £4,800. So this is not an insubstantial purchase made out of the company's monies. Um, Again, this order wasn't appealed. None of the orders to which repeat this order were appealed. This is the request. We want to ask as much information to understand what Miss Stefanova has been doing with the company's monies. Well, you know what she's been doing. She's been purchasing a handbag for £4,300 on the 18th of June 2021. I mean, whether she did so because she liked the red one rather than the blue one, or whether she liked Chanel rather than Valencia, yes. I mean, no, I understood where, where does it take you? No, but my, my lord, the, I didn't... I made a mistake referring to that paragraph. I know you did. I'm just illustrating the point that a request of this magnitude, um, populated by requests such as a four, can produce the sort of problems we're seeing in this case in litigation. Eight four wasn't a, any ground of contempt, admitted or otherwise. I know it wasn't. No, um, but, but the idea that these requests were narrowly focused, I'm putting to you the point that Mr. Howard is effectively making which is that this was a very long and um, uh, exorbitant series of requests. Now, your answer, I understand, is, but the court ordered it and it wasn't appealed. And she had 11 months to provide the information. Right. Um, I, I am just noting, though, that 844, for example, is the sort of thing which does lend a bit of tone to this particular statement that you might accept. Well, um, we've asked a question of, we're looking for the information she provided us. We discovered that she had spent £4,800, or wasn't sorry, £4,300 on a handbag out of the company's money. I don't think it's wrong in the circumstances of a dispute for my client to say, why are you spending £4,300 on a handbag? Is it a gift for a client? I don't know what her response is going to be. Is it some sort of allowance? Is it you say it's your salary? You say it's a dividend? Why have you spent that money? That's a legitimate question to ask, to try to work out where we stand at the end of it, and to the court ultimately knows what tribal issues they're going to be. Um, I, 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 we just don't know, my lord. But this is the reason we serve the Part 18 request, we're doing our best with limited information which Miss Stefanova has drip-fed to us, and, I, you know, and it has been an incredibly expensive, laborious process to get where we got to. But where we ask her for an account of all money, you know, as an example, she was found in contempt of court regarding that, and she hadn't provided um, and, and if the information she had provided in her November 2022 purported compliance witness statement, my lord, which is at 289 of the uh, supplemental bundle, just by way of an example, so Miss Stefanova has asked what she's been taking. Um, as a salary from 2020 to 2022 well nothing we then turn to uh, core bundle page 233 I think that's right just double check my lords but the answer you want to that you're drawing our attention to is Six in the middle of 289. Sorry. The, yes, this, sorry, I apologize. It's five, and, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm um, out of turn. I'm doing my best, given how many grounds of contempt there are, to identify, in the absence of actually knowing what an offensive appeal was until his submissions, to do the best I can with dealing with your lordship's um, uh, request. Five is dealing with the salary. She says she didn't take any salary, right, or she doesn't right. identify any salary for 2020 to 2022. Six deals with Miss Stefanova purporting to set out what expenses. So, which so one do you want us to concentrate both, on? Both, my lord, whilst we're here. As well, if, if I, I'm doing my best with. Uh, there's a great deal of contempt here, my lord, but these two, to do with monies Miss Stefanova's taken, five and six are concerned with 
money she's taken for salary, and six is concerned with is a more general request for her to tell us what money she's taken generally out of the business. And what we can see here is that she hasn't taken a salary according to her, or no figures put in there for 2020 to 2022, and she isn't putting, as I understand it, any information. Make sure this is absolutely right. Five was, what have you taken for salary? Six was, what else have you taken, essentially? Um, and we look at five, and it doesn't reflect reality. It's not correct, because Miss Stefanova then refers to, in her affidavit, in purported compliance. At page 234 at 75, Two, three, four on the core bundle, my lord. Core bundle. So what I'm doing is comparing Miss Stefanova's purported compliance document with His Honour Judge Parfit's order with the affidavit she served the evening before the contempt hearing. Stepanova has, in fact, when, it, when, push, when push comes to shove and, you know, the 11th hour said, OK, I've actually taken many tens of thousands of pounds more than what I previously said. Um, as regards to, um, I think she's dealing with this paragraph 68 onwards, but uh, paragraph 73 and page 233, She refers to alleged dividends, including the sort of 68,000 or thereabouts and her Mercedes. Right, so you say that when you look through the corrective. Um, witness statement. Sorry, the, the witness statement, which is in the core bundle, the two, three, two, and following. It becomes apparent that this earlier um, set of information was wrong and, under, and and accepted to be wrong. So these were admitted. These were admitted contempts. Um, okay. Yes, they were admitted contempts. The, the, I will take your lordships to the more serious of the contested contempt, and obviously the cash receipt, uh, the cash receipt part, where my own friend alluded to earlier. So Miss Stefanova gave instructions to my own friend confirmed he was the one that spent miserable time drafting the affidavit on behalf of Miss Stefanova. Miss Stefanova, Miss Stefanova had to identify the cash payments in her bank statements, and she was requested to do that in the Part 18 request. And in, a, in, in the affidavit, she says, these are all the cash payments. Your lordship's back in the core bundle. So, yes, in the core bundle. Turns, if you turn to um, page 239, paragraph 99. Uh, 
question is that, sorry, I'm simply... Oh, sorry, I'll just go for the yes. The question is that um, supplementary bundle, page 125 at the bottom, number 17. Yes. So we're trying to work out how much, because Ms. Stefanova has confirmed to us that she is receiving cash for the business. And, and we want to know what's happened to that cash, because this is a cash business which generates, it would appear, substantial amounts of cash. We're saying to her, well, what, what, you've got the bank statements now. We want to know what cash you received and who's paid it to you. Uh, where, where has it come from? In paragraphs 99 and 100, she says, well, I've gone through my bank statements with my legal team. She has cash payments into a bank account in her own name. Yes. The 1745 account. That's what a Barclays account is. Yes, my lord, that's correct. So you knew about this account. Had you had any, you'd had the bank statements for it? Yes, Ms. Stefanova had provided limited bank statements. This is beginning of 2018, 2019. Right. Um, so she had provided some bank statements at an earlier period. But we, it wasn't until the major transactions, I should say, my lords, the major transactions, the Mercedes, the, the legal fees, and, and all the rest of it, you, those transactions were sort of, they were 2021 onwards. Just sticking with request 17 on page yes, 125, you, you had the bank statements for, at any rate, some of the period. Yes. You could see there were payments in cash into the account, and you wanted to know what the source of them was. Indeed, yes. And what was the answer you got? You, so you get an answer in November 2022 by way of letter, which is at supplemental 356. Uh, and what's the answer you get to this question? So 356, sorry, 291. I'm sorry, 291. Not, not 356. <laughs> Thank you, my uh, The answer to 17, the, the question is too broad and unreasonable. Is that right? Yeah. Sure. That's right. Yeah. So she can't remember. Um, and then you, after you bring the contempt proceedings, you, you get the affidavit prepared with the assistance of Mr. Howard. And what's the answer there? That's a core 239. Correct, my lord, yes. And what is your submission? As found by the judge, Ms. Stefanova still hadn't complied with the terms of the order. In what respect? Um, it's at paragraph uh, 22, page 157. Of the core bundle? Core bundle, sorry, I do apologise, my lord, yes. flesh out what the judge is referring to about the Ms. Stefanova having admitted that the lady to provide information in her affidavit, albeit then still failing to list the further cash receipts identified by the petitioner. Um, what, that, what that relates to, my lord, is that um, having gone through Ms. Stefanova's bank statements, there is a code banks use to identify the nature of a cash um, uh, uh, deposit. And there's a code in the Barclays statements which refer to the machines they have in the branch. So if you pay cash into one of those machines they have in the branch, it's recorded at a particular code. My learned friend um, submitted to the judge, well, that was, it, there was a mis he, he didn't appreciate that code when he was drafting the witness statement. But the point's more fundamental. My, my learned friend, it's not my learned friend's evidence, it's Miss Stefanova's evidence. She knows what she's been doing with her bank account. She's been ordered to provide information about cash deposits. She only dealt with the ones which she was questioned about when my learner friend was pre clearly preparing the affidavit for her. And she left out any explanation for another tens of thousands of pounds of cash deposits going into her account. And, that, and, and as I understand it, yeah, months after the hearing, Miss Stefanova is still eventually, and belatedly, even after the contempt hearing, provided the information. The judge, so we turn, Mr. Richard Smith finds that her affidavit still is incorrect. She still hasn't provided information regarding the cash receipts. But the, the 
answer to my Lord's question, which is, I think, in essence, the last phrase, paragraph 22 of the judgment. Where do we find the, the further cash receipts identified by the petitioner? Where are they? Are they referred to in the judgment earlier? Or are no, they, they're, 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 they're not. Um, but it's not in dispute between the parties. Both sides accepted in the hearing that there were further cash payments. Yeah, but humorous. I mean, we went to the hearing, we didn't write the judgment. Where do we find these? Oh, sorry, my lord. Uh, the king. Um, I'm just going to, sorry, I'm going to find the personal bank statements um, dealing with this period. They. I'm struggling to find the abbreviations in the references, but, but again, my lord, we were... All, all I can say from the respondent's part here is we met, we did our best to meet the grounds of appeal, as in the four corners of the appellant's notice and my learned friend's skeleton. Uh, I appreciate matters have evolved and that Ms. Stepanova is being allowed outside the confines of the appellant's notice. Um, I'm, I'm, I think I... You know, if I'd known this was something which is going to be an issue to be raised today, we would have included, obviously, the bank statements, um, if that would assist the court. But again, it is not in, as the, my learned friend hasn't appealed, my, my Stephen Over hasn't appealed this aspect of the findings of the decision, that there are other transactions we identified. Um, there were many. Where... Um, so, I mean, it's, there's no easy place in which we could identify, see what was still undisclosed, as the judge found at the end of paragraph 22. There's no easy reference anywhere. Um, no, I mean, because both sides accepted um, at the hearing that when my learner friend was, and this, this is what he was submitted to the court, that during the course of him preparing Miss Stefanova's affidavit late into the evening, he hadn't personally appreciated there were a number of other cash payments which, ha which are identified by a certain anacronym in the bank statements. And, and that was confirmed, as I understood it, to be accepted and as found by the judge. Okay. Um, about seven of them. The inference is there may have been about seven of them. Yes. Um, uh, can I go back to my question, which is what is your submission? Yeah, you, you've made a complaint. Mr. Hallam's submissions have rather travelled outside his grounds. I don't particularly want to get into that. His, his grounds include the ground that this sentence was excessive, and one of the points he makes is, well, she was faced with a very large amount of requests, and she did her best, and okay, she didn't get it right, but it was, a, it was an attempt to, to do what she could. That's effectively was in its skeleton. Is it your submission that the judge found that she deliberately failed to deal with these seven cash payments and that he was entitled to so find, or that he didn't find that that was deliberate? What, what is your submission? Um, what my Lord, Ms. Stefanova didn't, was not prepared to give any evidence. She was yes. not prepared to go which, so we were, we, 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 the discoveries which were made um, I was unable to cross-examine her about... She's not obliged to give evidence. You don't Indeed. have a right to cross-examine a contemnor, alleged contemnor. She's entitled to take a stance on the basis of, of the evidence that is put forward by the applicant. I understood, my lord, but we've... The, the point goes to the, the seri whether or not the breach was um, intentional or yes. harm suffered. The breach was intentional because Miss Stefanova has had solicitors whilst these requests have been made. She hasn't provided the information. 
She's had repeated opportunities to do so. She, it's not suggested she can't read English. She, she knows of what we're asking her to do. She knows we're complaining that she hasn't done it. She's faced with a contempt application saying you haven't done these things. She's seen the affidavit evidence in support. Her response is to give limited information, because it was limited information, about the cash payments on that, this particular point, when my learner friend then prepared to draft her affidavit and then accepted during the course of the hearing, oh, there's lots of other cash payments which I also haven't referred to. Right. Well, and you say that was intentional, that the judge found it was intentional? The judge didn't find it was intentional. But what I'm saying is that the, it, it's hard to accept it wasn't intentional when one looks at the other misleading information that she has provided. Right. I, again, we're looking at things individually. Well, you have to. Each, each count is an individual count. It is. And, and obviously you can take into account the whole picture. Yes, my lord. The whole picture that the judge found was that these were, i try to get his precise wording in 31, serious and contumelious flouting. Now, contumelious means deliberate. Yes, my lord. Uh, I mean, if, if it's inadvertent or you misread what you were being asked or you overlook something, <laughs> that's not contumelious. It must mean. I knew I should have provided this and I didn't. But that's his overall finding. Yes. And we asked you a little while ago, give us your best example. And you've given us this example of the cash, um, and you've given us the example of the salaries, where it's just left blank, and it later transpires she did pay herself a salary. What are the other examples? The um, you rely on? pension, pension. Uh, my lord. So, as I understand it, page 124, paragraph 8.2, um, she, you, you asked for particulars of all monies received for her own personal benefit, including monies used to pay for legal fees. That would cover monies paid from the company into her pension. Yes. So that's, that's the request at 124. We then need to go to the answer she gave in November 22, which was, I think, 289. Nine. 289, my lord, yes. And where's the answer? The answer is. Uh, was it 28? It's 8 little. 288, so it's 288, my lord, yes. So she said she's roughly taken £100,000 in dividends over the past four years, pension, the first dependents paid to her as £30,000. Into a pension fund. Into a pension fund. Right. That was not true. Um, as she was forced to accept, it was actually double. It was sixty thousand pounds. Page core bundle, page two three three, paragraph seventy one. So it was sixty thousand pounds, and the explanation she gave in her affidavit, I think, was was that she just got the figure wrong. What does the judge find about that? This was an error, not intentional. What does the judge find? That she provided misleading information. Deliberately? He says something about the pension, doesn't he? Well, um, sorry, I'm just going to find the judgment. Yes, paragraph 33, my lord, and page um, 159. Whether or not the case on the merits against the respondents made out, and I leave that to others to decide, given the repeated opportunities afforded to the respondent to comply, that some misleading information at least was provided in response to the orders, including as to the respondent's legal fees and her pension payments, as well as the sequence of events which indicate the depletion of the very subject matter of those proceedings, namely Dermamed, whilst those proceedings are ongoing, and subsequently <coughs> disclosed information, including that gleaned from the Barclays Bank statements, which the petitioner only attained fully through its own third-party disclosure application, and more recently still, the information gleaned from Santander, I am sure that these were deliberate breaches of the orders to avoid disclosure of information which might otherwise have been given grounds for more serious and earlier intervention by the court. Now, you know, that's... So that, that, in your submission, is a finding that the misleading information in relation to the pension payments was deliberate. Yes. Sorry, my lord. Yes, I mean, absolutely. Yes. Um, was, he, was he entitled to make that finding? Was the judge entitled to make that finding? Yes. Yes, my lord. Despite the fact that she... What, what is the status of her affidavit? 
but if she's not submitted to cross-examination. Is it evidence in the case? Um, I how, remember how, was, how was the hearing conducted? Um, Ms. Stefanova, when we closed, Ms. Stefanova, uh, Ms. my learned friend on behalf of Ms. Stefanova confirmed that she wasn't prepared to be cross-examined. The judge warned her that adverse inferences could, could be drawn from her failure to give to be cross-examined on her affidavit. But he clearly had regard to that affidavit insofar as it consisted of admissions. Indeed he did. So it must have been put into evidence at least for that purpose. I, as regards to her confessions, as it were, of contempt, yes. But in terms of explanations, she was, pre she was putting forward innocent you know, con contrition. And she wasn't prepared to be cross-examined on anything which was, we were putting forward. Because our position was she was doing everything intentionally to prevent us discovering the true position. And she was she put forward thin excuses, which of course is the judge's finding. Um, Where does he say thin excuses? Uh, uh, paragraph forty. I've also noted this point as apologies to the court, although in light of what I've said about her motivation about the case and the somewhat thin excuses for non-compliance, which continue to pepper her affidavit, I'm unable to say she's remorseful. Again, not under appeal. Now, can I be sure I've understood the strict evidential position? Was there any order to the effect that unless she submitted to cross-examination, her affidavit should not be admitted? No, no, no. No. So, um, was she ordered to provide an affidavit, or did she do it voluntarily? She was, well, as it's contempt, she, it's, it's optional for her. We have to make good beyond reasonable yes. doubt, of course, my lord, our grounds. If we make good those grounds... There were directions given by Dame Wer Sarah Wellington, weren't there? There, there were. And what were her directions? Um, I think tab 15. The core bundle. Uh, 260. I'm obliged. It's paragraph 6. The first respondent, that's her, may file and serve. Yes. In response. So she's not obliged to do so, but she chooses to do so. Absolutely, my lord, yes. There's no provision for submission to cross-examination, but at the close of your case, um, her counsel says she's not going to give evidence, she's not, she's not going to submit to cross-examination. And the status of her affidavit in those circumstances, it seems to me, is that the judge is entitled to look at it, so it's admitted in evidence, because there's been no order saying that it can't be admitted, <laughs> insofar as it consists of admissions, it's clearly admissions against interest and entitled to have a regard to them. And so far as it consists of anything else, he's entitled to have a regard to it, but he is obviously going to pay it less attention, give less weight to it than he would have done had he heard of being cross-examined. Is that the correct position? Well, yes. I mean, I think another way of looking at it is when a witness is not prepared at a contempt hearing to be cross-examined on the part of the evidence which they need to give, regarding why they breached the order, and pleas and mitigation, any explanation, then the court was entitled to say, well, you're not prepared to be cross-examined because you're worried that you're going to be undermined and found to have lied. Yeah, you're, um, you're, entitled, you're entitled to say, I, I give very little weight to this explanation, but, it, but it's not, not the case that the affidavit is not before the court at all. No, no, the, the affidavit was, it was, it was before the court. Yeah. By, 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 yes. it, in those circumstances, I think your submission is that he was entitled to reach the conclusion of paragraph 33, taking the pension payment as an example, that the excuse she gave, the justification she gave for her admitted breach, which was that it was an oversight and a mistake, was one that he was not willing to accept. It was a, what he characterised as a thin excuse. And he's satisfied that it was deliberate. Yes. And your submission is he was entitled to reach that conclusion. He was, my lord, yes. Well, I think I understand entirely now how you put it. Can you tell me about the Mercedes? When did you first discover that she spent nearly £60,000 on this Mercedes? It was shortly before the freezing. I think maybe... When and how did you discover it? It was the pursuant to the Norwich Pharmacal application. Was it disclosed the... either in the November 22 letter or in the it was March week. 23 affidavit? Um... We discovered it before the March 23 affidavit through the provision of bank statements directly from Barclays. That's my, that's my understanding. Um, and then that's when 
we then um, yeah, that's when it was then featured in our petition and and in the uh, affidavit in support of the freezing injunction. It's not referenced in the November twenty two letter. No, it's not. No. And was that a ground? Was the failure to refer to it a, a ground of contempt? No. Uh, no, my lord, no. Right. Okay. I mean, we we were aware we were aware of it. There was no need to ask questions about it. As I understand, I think there was a position. But you're not suggesting that there was a. It's not part of the um, county court. Clutch of contempt finding. No. No, it, it was a breach due to failure to disclose the purchase of the stadium. Um, I mean, the Miss Stefanova was required in the county court order, it's not just part of it going all the way back to the 13th of May, to provide information about all, about all uh, money she'd taken out for herself. So, from that, so, it must, so it must follow that she should have told no, no, us. But, I mean, you can't yes. do it that way. I mean, if, if you're alleging that the failure to disclose purchases of the same was contempt, it would have to be identified clearly. No, no, we, we, you I mean, weren't. If I understood no. it correctly, that what you did when you issued your contempt application <coughs> was accuse her of not complying with information which you still had not got. Yes, that's correct. My so you didn't include the Mercedes, because no. by then you knew about it. Yes. Yes, I see. Okay. I, I, again, we were we looked at the evidence she provided in November. She's warned that she hadn't complied with the order. We then got the freezing injunctions, which she hadn't complied with. And then on the same day, because my client had enough at that point, because she wasn't complying with the court orders, two applications were made, two separate contempt applications, one in respect of the Judge Parfit's order and one in respect of Mr Justice Saccaroli and Mr Justice Mead's order. They were issued at the same time, dealing with the then breaches. And if I can, uh, just to that, uh, to pausing there for a second, my lords, um, one of the points my learned friend made about the more of a background, and this isn't included in the sort of four corners of the charge sheet, um, that's misconceived because our obligation of contempt application, as per the you know, CPR 81, is to only set out the terms of the order and how we say the, the respondent has breached the terms of the order. The purpose of the affidavit in support is to flesh that, it's obviously to evidence that and to provide a factual matrix to what's going on to enable the court to be in the best position when it comes to sentencing. The onus is on, if we persuade the court beyond reasonable doubt that Miss Stefanova hasn't complied with the order, the onus falls on Miss Stefanova to provide evidence to explain away, with the benefit of cross-examination for the court, why she's done or hasn't done what she is supposed to have done. Um, and she wasn't prepared to do that. And, 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 and the evidence, you know, to the 11th hour, we get 24 admissions, contempt, six contested. Um, she's refusing to give any evidence and, and excuses are thin it's just bare assertions, oh I'm, I apologise it was ac accidental which the judge really given the judge refers to the history in the earlier parts of his judgement as to how we ended up to his own judge Parfit's order and the fact that Miss Stefanova has provided as we've seen inaccurate misleading information, she says one thing oh, only £30,000 in my pension and then oh actually it's sixty. she never volunteers anything, what the judge could see was that we've had to go to the bank directly, we find information out, there's still lacunae in what we understand, but it's always, it's a kind of game of cat and mouse we have with her, she's never forthcoming uh, and that's going back to the Revolut account, she knew we knew about the Santander account, which is why it features in her witness state, her affidavit but she knows more than what she's letting on, that's the problem, and the judge had, other than the Revolut account point he could see the evolution of where we started off in the proceedings to where we had ended up in front of his, his Justice Richard Smith. And it was impossible, I think, impossible for my Miss Stefanova to say, well, the you know, she hadn't acted intentionally. It was, it was plain she had. She wasn't some litigant person who can't read and understand okay. English. Right, we, we've been focusing, right, we've been focusing at the moment on the county court orders. I mean, I'm still, I think you're beginning to move into the High Court orders, aren't you, though? Um, well, if I just briefly pause on detriment, because I think the Lordship asked a point about detriment to us, uh, the yeah. County Court order. Um, I, what, what I will say is that the, the effect of my client has been that he won on the 6th of October 2021. Um, it's now September 2023, 
he's incurred substantial costs, as found by the judge, having to go to court repeatedly, inviting the court's intervention to assist him, get Ms. Stefanova to provide information to enable my client to obtain relief. My client hasn't even obtained a cost order from the trial, notwithstanding the presiding judge Gerald's findings, because everything's been put back to when the issue of relief is determined. So there's a mixture of having to go through the stress and ordeal, having to repeatedly come back to the court to pay for that, costing, as your lordships can imagine, a vast sum of money, and being prevented from getting the relief. And again, as to the intentional breaches as found by the judge, Ms. Stefanova's objective is quite plain. She doesn't want to come clean about the financial position of the companies, and she wants to prevent Mr. Khawaja, the respondent, from obtaining any relief. Those two objectives explain everything that has happened leading up to this point, my lords. So it's your submission that the harm you suffer from the breaches of the county court order, instead of getting on with an assessment of damages or other relief, you have to devote your energies and money to pursuing information which drags out the whole process and puts off the evil day in which you might have to pay something. Is that what it comes to? In a nutshell, my lord, yes. Mr. Howard characterised it as delay, and it sounds to me as if you don't really dissent. Your position is, well, delay is prejudice in a case like this. Delay per se, I can see arguments either way, but delay which is causing prejudice, which is here, like we use late cheese and not, for purposes of late cheese, delay in itself is not sufficient. One has to have detriment suffered by, as a result of the delay. And what I'm saying here is the detriment suffered by my client as a result of Ms. Stefanova's breaches, intentional breaches of the court's orders, has to prevent my client getting cost of trial, getting any relief in the county court, and to turn this matter into what should be quite straightforward, into satellite litigation and a complete nightmare for Mr. Khawaja. I mean, that's where we are. Yes, okay. Well, I understand that submission. Thank you. Now, I think you were going to move on to the high court. I'm happy to say something about contrition, but I can move on to the high court, my lord. Well, I think I'd like to understand in what respect the high court breaches were serious, because Mr. Howard had a submission. When you looked at them, they really didn't add up to much more than a row of beans. Well, my lords, there are two aspects to the high court orders in terms of provision of information. One was an affidavit with the standard position where a- Affidavit of assets. Affidavit of assets, my lord, yes, precisely. And the other one was provision of bank statements, which was three aspects. And the next one was provision of weekly bank statements. So Mr. Justice Zaccaroli required, ordered Ms. Stefanova to provide an affidavit of assets. She entirely failed to comply with that. Ms. Justice Mead found that she intentionally failed to comply with that. He suspected intentionally, sorry. Yes, I mean, I was going to say, what is the finding in relation to that? Is there a finding of- The judge seems to sort of say, well, Mr. Justice Mead said he strongly suspected that it was deliberate. But I don't- Did he actually make a finding in that respect? Well, we have, my lord, the transcript of Mr. Justice Mead's judgment. And it's page 178 of the supplemental bundle, I think. Just double check. Yes. I think it's paragraph six of that. And what I can do is ask your lordships to- Your lordships could briefly read that. I'd be very grateful. Sorry, which page? Page 179 of the supplemental bundle, my lord. Paragraph six. Thank you. Yes, okay. 
So what Mr Justice Mead in effect did is say to Mr Stephanova, well, you want a second chance, as it were, to provide the affidavit of means, which was obviously to identify assets over a certain amount. Um, she had to provide uh, copies of bank statements and also an additional provision that she had to provide an ongoing, on a weekly basis, bank statements for bank accounts to which she was a signatory. Now, my learned friend um, has sought to limit the first part regarding the affidavit of means, saying, well, I'm not sure what they're But when you say affidavit of means, so affidavit of assets, I do apologise, my lord. Affidavit of assets, Miss Stephanova setting out what assets she owned over a value of more than a thousand pounds. Okay, so, yeah, so this isn't anything to do with living expenses. No, no, I do apologise, my lord. Sorry, yes. yeah, right, I couldn't. That's yes. Sorry, let's go back. Yep. The breach that is said to have occurred in relation to Justice Zaccaroli's order is what the breach of the obligation to list assets over a certain amount and to provide bank statements. Yes. Okay. Um, so. Where do we find that breach or that explanation of breach? Is that the breach that's being referred to? Uh, yes, my lord. The breach is the contempt of court related to um, Miss Stefanova having failed to provide the list of assets and the value of the assets. So although Miss Stefanova did provide eventually confirmation that she was the owner of the shareholding in the companies, what she hadn't provided was the value of those assets. Yeah, the reason I ask that is because the paragraph to which you've referred to is, is Justice Mead's judgment, paragraph 6, is dealing with a completely different point. It's dealing with the amount of living expenses. Well, it also says at the end, my, my lord, that um, she has that, that has included some financial information. Uh, sorry, sorry, it's in the middle. That has included some financial information, such as screenshots showing that her accounts have been frozen, but she has been uh, conspicuously, and I very suspect, deliberately not complied with the disclosure order of Mr Justice Zaccaroli. So, but he's, he's talking there about the asset disclosure order. He is, my lord, yes. Right. Um, the, what, what happened at the hearing is Miss Stefanova was saying, I need money for my, the living expenses limitation of £1,000 per week is insufficient. Miss Stefanova was asking for more. Yeah. And, and, and the judge was saying, you haven't provided, not only have you breached Mr Justice Zaccaroli's order, and you're more focused on trying to get the exceptions. You haven't actually complied with Mr. Zachary's order at all in relation, disclosure. In relation to disclosure of assets. Yes. Yes, my lord, right. yes. Right. Um, but in, in terms of the, the bank statements, now, I, you, you, my, I'm not going to take the lordship. But just before you leave Sorry. the assets, was there any other breach of the assets disclosure order other than the failure to list the shareholders and their value? Uh, no, that, that was limited yes. to that, my lord, yes didn't know that she was the shareholder of the... Well, we, well, absolutely, my lord, yes, of course. Um, okay. And then bank statements. So in, in terms of the bank statements, obviously to enable us to police the freezing injunction, which is why the court made this particular order, we needed to have not only the bank statement showing what the position as what is as at the date of the order being made, whether or not Mr Justice or Mr Justice Mead, or indeed Dame Sola Worthington's order in February, we also needed to have an ongoing obligation to provide bank statements. Now, of course, importantly, the fact that this is in circumstances where Ms. Stefanova is the, the sole secretary for the relevant bank accounts, the sole director of the business, and is plainly in a pos position to, what well, in effect, do whatever she wants with the monies coming in, so, which is why the court ordered her to provide weekly bank statements. Um, so Ms. Stefanova, in, in breach of that order, failed to provide the bank statements. Now, um, pausing there, at this time the orders were made, Miss Stefanova had only disclosed the existence of accounts held with Barclays Bank. So we were operating on the basis that Barclays were her bankers. That was her position. What, is, you mean her personal bank accounts? No, no, all, all bank accounts. Her other companies. Hers and the companies? Yes, my lord. Yeah. There was an account with the Biote uh, Biotechnologies UK Limited, which is the new the new company, had its had a bank account with Barclays. German Med Solutions had a bank account with Barclays. I think Miss Stefanova identified in her affidavit because she was request required to provide uh, a list of her bank accounts. Only listed Barclays accounts. I think there were seven in total. And, and so um, what happened is, um, Mr. and again, this, this is in the documentation, Mr. Justice Richard Smith was um, 
brought to Mr. Richard Smith's attention, which is why he reached the conclusion he did about giving excuses about non-compliance. Ms. Stefanova, the freezing order was made on the 13th of December <coughs> by Ms. Justice Zaccaroli. Um, Ms. Stefanova seems to have become aware of its existence on the 15th of December because she then engages in correspondence with Barclays, um, you know, trying to get money out of her account for the living expenses. Um, and so her, her attention was focused on that. Uh, she was in communication via an email address. Ms. Stefanova um, could have simply asked for copies of her bank statements from Barclays and she didn't do that, which is why um, by the time we issued the contempt application, Ms. Stefanova hadn't provided those bank statements. Any bank statements, as I understand, in pursuit from a certain date. She provided some bank statements, but as your Lordship will see from um, uh, the, the, the uh, recital of Mr. Justice Smith, Richard Smith's order, there are many bank statements she hadn't provided. So, again, you can't police a freezing injunction unless you have the bank statements. Um, so, Ms. Stefanova's uh, conduct it, it, it rendered, to a certain extent, the freezing injunction um, of limited, well, from our perspective, we didn't know what was going on with the company. We didn't know. And more importantly, it's not, my learned friend will no doubt say, well, the freezing injunction was there, it prevented her from spending money. The problem is that um, the money was going elsewhere. We didn't know that. Which is why Miss Stefanova was opening up the bank, the other bank accounts. So the Santander account was opened up in her personal name. When was that opened? Uh, that was on the sixth of January. I just find the reference to the bank state. Twenty twenty-three. Sorry, my lord. Twenty twenty-three. Twenty twenty-three, my lord. Yes, it's a page uh, supplemental bundle three seven three. And to put this into um, context, we wrote Miss Stefanova's solicitors, um, who's here today, on the 15th of March, saying, we've just discovered, or we've been informed by Santander, that your client's got a bank account with Santander. Please tell us about all bank accounts that your client has, in addition to the Barclays account. How, did you, just, how did you discover about the Santander account? My, my judging solicitors um, were becoming, or my, sorry, my client, becoming concerned Miss Stefanova um, wasn't wasn't complying with the freezing injunctions um, in terms of where the monies were going. So the, the decision was made to serve more banks with the right. freezing injunction. Um, so it was a complete accident, my lord, is, is the answer. Um, if you fire out enough freezing injunctions into the various different banks, as we discovered in this case, some of them turn around and say, yes, actually, Miss Stefanova has an account with us. I see. Um, and here, at the Santander account, we asked about on the 15th of March, and her solicitor, she instructed her solicitor to say, not, I've got other accounts, but uh, what do you know about this account? Um, Where's that? Where's that? Uh, I'll just find that response, my lord. That is... Um, don't think... That is in the bundle. Okay. It was definitely something which before Mr. Justice Richard Smith, I, um, but my, my, everybody was taken to that relevant documentation. Um, I mean, my Mr. The, the recipient of the letter was in court today, so I don't think, as I understood it, this was going to be remotely. Is it dealt with on the twenty seventh of March? Sorry, my lord. David, is is the Santander account dealt with? On the it is. So where was paragraph twenty four of the affidavit, my lord, which is at page. Two two one. Two two one. Yes, my lord. Okay. Right. So, by this date, my lord. So this affidavit is dated the twenty seventh of March, twenty twenty three, evening before the contempt hearing. Miss Stefano was aware, because we'd written to her, her solicitors, uh, a, few, a week before, or so, saying, please explain the Santander account. Please can explain this to Metro Bank. And we don't get a response until we receive this affidavit. Right. I think uh, 
keeping an eye on the time, yes, given, given that Mr Howard's got to have an opportunity to reply, probably want you to sort of move towards making the, the other points you want to make. You want to make an application for fresh evidence, um, which I think probably fits in somewhere around here. It does, my lord. I was, that was, um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the indication, my lord. Yes. So, uh, what other points do you think you need to cover? Um, <coughs> I can deal with ground two as per the, um, the grounds of appeal very quickly, maybe in about two minutes. Well, let's do that now. What's it? Ground two, ground ground two, two was the judge failed to confine the sentencing to matters yes. alleged in the contempt application, but took into account wider allegations of fraud. Um, the judge didn't take into account wider allegations of fraud, uh, fraud. The, the ground of appeal was misconceived. But my learned friend was suggesting that, and again, I dealt this point briefly a few moments ago, that it's there's some sort of obligation on an applicant in a contempt application to include absolutely all the background in the contempt application. Otherwise, the judge can't look at it when it comes to sentencing, can't look at the uh, evidence when it comes to sentencing, which is misconceived. Again, um, the contempt application is the, the order, the allegations of contempt, and then the affidavit sets out the background and evidence is the, the, the contempt. Um, and that's what we did. And we, we, and we, on the basis of our evidence, we said this was all part of an orchestrated attempt to prevent us getting relief and to um, delay um, inevitable. So ground two falls away, my lords. Ground three has already been withdrawn. Yes. Ground four is the idea that consecutive sentences are wrong and irrational. Mr. Howard didn't press that. He, he didn't simply said, thought. "Look at you have to look at the totality. It's eight months yes. is too long overall." Um, one of the points is that the, the my, 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 I didn't quite understand was, and this is an, a relatively important point because it goes to Ms. Stefanova's general conduct when it comes to these proceedings, is the idea that both sets of proceedings, the petition and the county court proceedings, are in effect the same set of proceedings. That was the submission made in my learned friend's skeleton argument. Um, and what I would point out is that Ms. Stefanova has adopted a very abusive position regarding that submission because when we made an application to transfer the county court proceedings to be heard, to be she, case managed, she, together, it successfully. she successfully opposed that, my yes, lord. Yes, I think um, we have that point. So, uh, my lord, I, I just to confirm, so I um, can hand it up. Your, your lordship has the point. I understand that the, the failure to the freezing junction wasn't just the existence of the shares; it was the fact that Stephen Over hadn't provided the value of the shareholdings. I, I've made your lordships have that point. Um, Sorry, my lord. If if the only reason that we were standing here or sitting here was that Stephen Over had not put a, well, either disclosed the shares, the very shares which. Um, are the subject of the litigation, or put a value on them, you would be hard pushed to bring contempt proceedings, would you not? I mean, you know, yeah, it's yeah. not an asset you were, as my lord put to you, it's an asset you were fully, went, fully aware of, in fact, it's referred to in the order. Yes. The order says this order applies in particular to the shares. Um, uh, absolutely. My lord, that's. Uh, so, yes. so, I mean, that, that really is to make weight that very, very. My lord, there are thirty separate grounds of contempt. Thirty, as regards to. You can say yes. Yeah, yes, yes, that, that is correct. Okay. But but again, the strand again the Hadji is the you know the, the strands of a rope point. Miss Stefanova isn't guilty of one or two, three minor matters. There's a vast array of contempts of court. Thirty of them, twenty four of them, as I understand, um, or was it twenty six? No, 2025 related to the order. Simply because you raised it. I'm Sorry, my lord. trying to knock the. Yes. The, the, the shares point is really not why we're here. I. Again, so, I was. I, so far as the High Court is concerned, I understand you to say that the, the real problem was she wasn't giving you weekly rolling bank statements. So you, you can't police what's not there. And um, she didn't tell you about the Santander account that you stumbled on it. Mm. Um, and I think you want to say that. Um, Pressure shows there was another account she didn't tell you about. Um. Yes, that's that's correct. But again, I know I anticipate my learned friend's response is going to be, well, the, freeze, the Barclays are aware of the freezing injunction. They've been pretty overzealous when it comes to not prevent, not permitting Miss Stefanova to take monies from the account. Therefore, what's your problem? 
that's going to be the submission and response. And, and our point is, yes, it would have slowed Miss Stefanova down from being able to take monies out of those accounts. But where is the money going? Unless we're provided with weekly bank statements showing money coming in, then if the money is coming in, we think, OK, the money's there, it's safe. But if we're not getting the bank statements, uh, which would otherwise show monies aren't coming in, it starts raising the question mark, OK, well, if you're not coming into the Barclays account, where are they going? Um, and that's when we have the secret opening of the Santander account. And your Lordship seen the explanation there. Um, it suggested that monies uh, there are from Miss Stefanova's ex-partner. Uh, um, again, there was a question, there were various questions um, about this which were raised because it, it suggested these were cash payments that she'd received from her partner. Um, who my learned friend then confirmed to the court was actually resident in Texas in the United States of America. So the it would be, I mean, I'm not sure they're suggesting he was posting the money, it, um, the substantial amount of cash doesn't sit comfortably with that. But again, Ms. Stefanova was not prepared to be cross examined on that point. Um, but what we have, at the very least, are two bank accounts which Ms. Stefanova opened after the freeze, the date of the freezing injunctions. That goes to whether or not Ms. Stefanova was doing these, take, doing, you know, taking this sort of course of action intentionally. So we say it's intentional. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I, I do recall what you, you've gone through at speed, but can you just, for my notes, give me the cross reference to the where I find the explanation that you've just been outlining? Oh, sorry, my lord, yes. The, the, the explanation as per Ms. Stefanova's. Um, Santander account and Metro Bank account is at page, the core bundle, page 221, paragraph 24. Um, the information regarding the Texas point was something which my learned friend stated, uh, as I understand it, uh, during the course of his submissions, which are in the bundle. I'm just going to find the reference to that. Uh, so the, the is this right? The, Yes, um, the reference to Texas, I think. 117. 117 core bundle. And my response when we're dealing with this in submission was at page 126. Or should say, um, the point I raised was at page 126. At the bottom, H to A over the page. Sorry, what page? Um, one, a core bundle, my lord, page yeah. 126. 126. Uh, you can see my submissions to Mr. Justice Richard Smith um, on uh, H 126, raising it. My learned friend uh, 117, I think it's his page one, core bundle 117. This was going to the source of the monies. Yes, I see. And so your point of referring to this is not because it's the ground contempt, because it's. But we're talking here about the um, Santander account. This is not within the corners of the contempt application. You're referring to it because it's what's said to show lack of contrition. Lack of, well, lack of contrition, but a deliberate contumelious breach of the freezing injunction because. Miss Stefanova, Miss Stefanova didn't accidentally open up the bank accounts at the same time as not providing the Barclays statements of breach of the order. Sorry. The 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 breaches that you are allowed to proceed against Miss Stefanova for yes. are those set out in the contempt application. 
They are the biggest. Is. And how does the Santander existence of the Santander account relate to those breaches? They, 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 well, um, they would have been breaches had, at the time of issuing the contempt applications, we only were aware yes, of the Barclays account. So therefore, um, it was not the Santander account was not something that was included within the, um, and it, within the contempt application as a specific contempt. No, it wasn't, my lord. Right. So you can't rely upon it as a specific ground of contempt. So no. my question is, why are we being told about it? Is it because you say it's relevant to sentence? It is relevant to sentence, my lord. Yes. And why? It's relevant to sentence because it shows that being far from contrite and being full and frank. Which is what I put to you about two minutes ago. Sorry, so I do apologise. Yes, then. The answer is yes. Sorry. I, yes. Right. Um, I, I apologise for the mis. And is that the way in which the judge dealt with it? Um, or is this something that you would now? I mean, it, you know, is this really a, an additional point, a new point? The judge refers in two parts um, in the judgment to the, our recent discovery of the Santander, Metro Bank, and Bank of Scotland accounts, paragraph 11, my lord, at page 155. And 33. And 33. Um, he uses it as buttressing his finding of deliberate breach in 33. Indeed. Which is, the, I, again, you'll, to confirm, to respond to your lordship's question, if I had done earlier, Way the answer would be yes. That's the, that's the point. This is how the judge is analysing it. Correctly, of course. And I and of course the the sole although it was accepted, Miss Stefanova was still in contempt of court. It had failed to purge her contempt in respect of his honour judge Parfit's order, uh, and she had said uh, that she would provide the information after the hearing. That didn't form the basis of the terms of the suspension of the prison sentence. That was limited to the outstanding bank statements as defined in Mr Justice Richard Smith's order. And those outstanding bank statements were all bank statements for all bank accounts, which were well, all bank accounts from the 28th of January, which is the cut-off point for the contempt application. So Mr Stefanova had decided not to provide any of the bank statements after the date of the contempt application limited the bank statement she provided to us on the eve of the contempt application to those up to the 28th of January. So the judge said to Ms. Stefanova, well, or ordered her, that she'd go to prison unless she provided the outstanding bank statements within, I think it was 28 days. Now, this goes, again, to the revolute account, the new counterpoint. The judge, we are being told, Ms. Stefanova's come clean, she's contrived innocent breaches and so on. The judge doesn't accept it. But everybody's operating, at least at that stage, on the basis that Mr. Stefanova has provided or admitted to the Santander account, the Metro Bank account, and that she is going to provide outstanding bank statements, which, of course, she would be in contempt of court for not providing. And she fails to comply with that condition. She's, very, she's late, so she breaches the terms of that condition. And in June this year, my solicitors, um, having decided to well, come across these other lesser known uh, financial institutions such as Revolut have served the freezing injunction on them who have come back and said oh Miss Stefanova has an account with us um, Miss Stefanova admits that provides some sort of explanation of why she's done that but that's an account she opened on the, on the 2nd of March 2023 operated for 20 days 2022 until she closed it down and then 2022 sorry uh, 22nd of March 2023 is the date she closed the account, which is um, five days before she signed her affidavit, which at paragraph 24 says, for the sake of completeness, I will deal with the Santander and Metro Bank account. Now, again, echoing my lord, you can't rely on this as another breach, because that's not what we're here for. You, re you rely on it as supporting Intentional non compliance with the injunction and lack of contrition. Indeed, my lord, yes. You said a moment ago that she, ex she admitted the revolution account and gave some explanation. She did, my lord. 
you have that? I unfortunately hasn't made its way into the bundle, but I have Miss Stefanova's emails, which I, it's just two short emails provided by Miss Stefanova. I'm, I'm more than happy to hand it up to your Lordship. Um, these are her recent emails that she sent to us, if I may. Well, we haven't yet decided whether to admit the, the fresh evidence. Um, I think, I think at the moment, we have your point on the basis of the fresh evidence that you want to admit. Um, I think I'm going to ask you to draw your submissions to a close. Are there, there are other points you want to make? I'll just um, confirm, my Lord. I think those are my submissions, my lords. Uh, if this, I can be of any further uh, assistance. No, thank you. I'm thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Howard. Um, just a few very small points, and because you could end up slightly in the thickets and the weeds. <coughs> uh, no adverse inference was drawn from the failure to give evidence. At least there's no mention of that in the judgment, and that's why ground three was deleted from the yep. draft grounds of appeal when the transcript came through. And, and, and that, was, that was right. Um, well, whether or not it was right, it was the judge's decision. Um, the worst example my learned friend was asked judge, for. The judge was entitled to say, um, if it was slightly more broadly, though, um, that he, presumably he, he would accept the affidavit that was put in as admission. Yes. Um, he was entitled, presumably, then to draw an inference or conclusion as to whether the breaches were deliberate on the basis of the evidence he had. Yes, but he didn't draw an adverse inference from the non-submission to cross-examination. Right. It was mentioned that she refused to be cross-examined. I think a couple of times. Okay. Um, and, uh, and and that that do you, do you dissent from the way I put it to Mr. Rose? that she was clearly um, entitled to decline to offer herself cross-examination, but that necessarily meant that the explanations she gave in her affidavit um, would be given, or the judge was entitled to give them less weight than he would have done had he heard her being cross-examined. Yes, right, well, and, and, and in, in weighing up that, he doesn't actually go into any of this at all in, in his explicit reasoning, but in weighing up that, he would also be entitled to take into account other reasons why she might uh, not wish to have submitted to cross-examination in the presence of Mr. Kawaja, um, it having been signalled in advance in the skeleton argument before the hearing that um, she was going to be accused of using her 10-year-old daughter as a shield against custody and various other things of that sort which are really entirely nothing to do with, with the business of, 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 of uh, Dermamed or um, biotechnologies. But well, obviously, we'd be more or less told in advance what she was liable to get asked about in, in, a, in a no doubt um, hostile fashion. So, anyway, he didn't draw an adverse, he didn't draw any express adverse inference. And um, my learned friend was asked for his worst example, and he went first of all to commercial activities, which is paragraph 86 of Judge Parfit's order which becomes allegation 2.8 in the um, County Court contempt application, which is to be found at page 185, and it just says failed to, com failed to give the, the information uh, under paragraph 86. Uh, the affidavit answer is at C, uh, call bundle 235, and is a table.
and um, there it is on the, on, the, on the bottom two thirds of the page uh, is the table. It starts with a couple of reverse payments, i.e. her lending money to the company, total 11,500, then goes down to the fourth from the bottom loan repayment slash loan advance to director, which is where you get uh, the 11,500 has just run out at the end of that payment, the total paid is 12,350, and then four directors loan advances to her, that's it. You, yeah, you say that's it, but that means this is an acceptance on the eve of the committal oh, yes. application, that what was previously said in response to the court order was not an it was a breach. Yes, not, not, that's not, right. Yeah. There's some text explaining it, uh, as there is um, in relation to salary on the uh, page before, 234. And indeed, in relation to dividends on 233, which includes the Mercedes, which was uh, recorded as a dividend. Um, I'm asked to make clear that there's no um, admission by me, formally admitting to this court, of any misfeasance in relation to the transfer of the business on the closing of company one and beginning of company two in my remarks this morning. Um, those are live issues on the petition. And I, I have not understood you to accept that there's been any impropriety. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear my Lord say that. And if I ever see the transcript, I hope, I, I, I hope you will be right. I thought that was what I thought too, but I'm just asked to make it clear. I mean, they are clearly live issues and there are clearly serious questions to be decided, but I this judge did not determine them. He was quite clear that that was for another day, and it seems to me he was quite right. Thank you. Thank you, Mother. What do you want to say about the fresh evidence application? Well, um, the application uh, was made late, um, two weeks ago. The information was apparently available on the 15th of June. That's the first. Uh, email was shown from Revolut. Um, at that point, there was an outstanding application for fresh evidence already, which Lord Justice Newey dealt with on the 16th of July, um, 14th of July, or dated and stamped. Uh, the 16th. Um, we were were told that they only got the statements on the 16th of July, which is rather surprisingly a Sunday. Um, no explanation of why it took a month from the original contact from um, Revolut and uh, why it then took five weeks to make the application at all. But Lord Justice Newey excluded the other earlier evidence for two reasons, one of which doesn't apply because it was subsequent to the 27th of March, but the other of which continues to apply, which is that it's liable to raise factual issues which court might be able to deal with and possibly cause delay to the hearing which needs to be dealt with as swiftly as possible. My Lord, Lord Justice Newey's order is at score bundle 263, the very last, almost the last page, perhaps the last page of score bundle. So that, that's my submission, it's, it, it's far too late. Just to the, the fresh air evidence applications, just to deal yes. with a couple of points. The first point is my, my reference is it's, um, th there was a big delay in us providing the bank statements. He doesn't understand why that was, because Revolut wouldn't provide them to Miss Stepanova, who then provided them to us. So that's the reason there was a delay. It wasn't that we were delaying. We, we, it's not our account. It's yeah. Miss, the reason why there was a delay from June to July. That's the explanation, um, and. Uh, the application, I haven't actually taken your lordships to it, but there should be um, a bundle of unagreed documents. And I think the application notice dated the 22nd of um, August. Uh, 
I'm not sure we have it. not got it. We haven't got it. That's why I was, I was just asking. The application all. notice, all the evidence, and, the, the, the evidence and support. The, um, um, the, it's definitely been filed and served, and yes. Master Meacher, Master Meacher has already granted part of our application for the supplemental bundle. Yes. Which, strangely, it, it was, was all the same application. It was all part of the same application notice. Um, at what was the, the date of the application notice? Twenty second of August, twenty twenty three, my lord. Um, and in the application, when did, you, when did you receive the information from Revolut? The bank statements, which we see at pages five and six. So my, my starting sister is just going to confirm the precise date, Lord. According to the notice of application, the date is the 16th of July. 16th of July, my Lord. It's over a month. And, I mean, I know these appeals come on quickly. To give you plenty of time to at least indicate Mr. Fernandez's solicitor that that's what you were thinking of doing. Well, but, but, my lord, um, it's a. I know there was a lot to, else to deal with. But, but well, I was going to say, well, it's, it's more straightforward than that. Um, it's the it's hard to criticise Mr. Kawaja for finding information out that Mr. Fernova has previously said shouldn't exist. Um, Miss, and it is simply a case of Mr. Fernova, as she admits. Opened up an account at Revolut on the 2nd of March, closed it on the 22nd, and the, and the bank statement your lordships will see uh, exhibited to the application notice show that substantial sums went in and out during the 20 days, which none of that's being denied. Miss Stepanova has had an opportunity, my lords, to put evidence in response to the application um, she's known about for you know a couple of weeks, and she's with solicitors and counsel, not in, and in person, made a conscious decision, no doubt not to provide evidence in response, my lord. So it's as simple as that. Thank you. Well, uh, we're very grateful to both council and uh, those sitting behind them. Um, we will reserve our judgments, uh, which will come as no surprise to you. Uh, they will be handed down in draft in the usual way. The drafts will come with a embargo uh, as you are probably now familiar with, and the embargo means what it says. Uh, and um, we will then expect to hand down judgments remotely, as is now the norm, without any pretendants, and you will be invited.